Hello and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. Our special guest today from Washington, D.C. is Jack Posobiec. Jack is a One America News Network correspondent. He's a former Navy intelligence officer. He's been stationed all over the world, including China. Jack speaks fluent Mandarin, but this won't be in Mandarin. Let's do it in English. And most importantly, Jack was stationed uh, at Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay, and we're going to talk about that today. Welcome, Jack. Barry, thanks so much for having me on. I, uh, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to be here. And, and yes, I promise to keep the Mandarin to a minimum. <laughs> It'll sound like dinner, but uh, you could be saying anything and I won't even know what you're doing. So let's <laughs> do it in English. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, Gitmo to start with. Um, when were you there and what did you do in what capacity? Sure, well, you know, and, and sort of the, the basic disclaimer that I always have to say, Say is that I obviously can't get into uh, the intimate details of what I did. I am under a lifetime NDA as uh, as someone who had that uh, top secret SCI clearance, but uh, I did serve there from 2012 to 2013. I served in and uh, with what they would call an individual augmentee uh, status. That's when you're you're called up for service and then sent down range. Uh, in my case, they uh, they said, "Hey, they need somebody for." It was either Afghanistan or Guantanamo, and uh, they pulled two guys out of my unit and they said, you're going to Afghanistan, you're going to Guantanamo. And so that, off I went, right? And um, uh, I was basically stationed in their human intelligence uh, uh, analysis cell or um, what, what people I think, you know, collectively would refer to as the interrogation cell. And uh, I was there as an intelligence analyst. Well, that's a perfect segue to my first important question, which is, the people that have a little bit of knowledge of Guantanamo uh, as a prison, uh, a prison for our most high important valued uh, enemies of America have this image in their mind uh, from the media that it's the worldwide torture center. And if you remember during the Obama years, President Obama made a very big deal. We must close Guantanamo. We must eliminate this horrible blight on America's reputation. So you were there. Are all the torture stories, the waterboarding, and the vicious treatment of these Islamic terrorists accurate? And if not, correct the, correct the record. Yeah, it's actually completely inaccurate. Um, you know, I, I served there. I had um, basically full access to the facility uh, in where I worked and, and in what I was able to, uh, where I was able to maneuver. Uh, there, there was no uh, mistreatment. There was no uh, torture that I observed or at any point had any information of whatsoever. And I certainly, you know, as an Intel guy, you're asking around, you're, you're poking into things. That's sort of the nature of our business. Um, as a matter of fact, the program that many people are referring to when they talk about uh, quote unquote torture is the enhanced interrogation program. And enhanced interrogations were not conducted at Guantanamo Bay. That was a CIA operation that was conducted at black sites around the world, the salt pits, uh, places in Afghanistan, a couple other ones in third party countries, Thailand, for example. And so when people conflate that with Guantanamo Bay, uh, that's actually conflating it with a completely separate operation whereas Guantanamo Bay is actually run by the Pentagon. And so our program was under the auspices of the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA. Um, interestingly enough, the director of the DIA, when I did my deployment through DIA, was uh, three-star general, uh, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. Oh, what a small world that is. Yeah. So I, uh, as you and I have talked about, I have a very close friend who was at Gitmo, um, a major in the Marine Corps, and she told me that the prisoners there actually lived better in terms of air conditioning, food, recreation, uh, the ability to move around, I mean, obviously within the wire. Uh, can, you, can you address that for a sec? Well, it's certainly, uh, <laughs> it's certainly um, arguable uh, because when you're there, um, of course, the U.S. doesn't have a status of forces agreement with Cuba for uh, obvious political reasons. And so when you're stationed at Guantanamo Bay, you are confined to the, you know, essentially 30 square miles of the base. Uh, you, you're not allowed to leave and there's not that many amenities on the base thereof. I mean, yes, we can go to the, 
know, the commissary, we can go to the DFAC to get some chow, but for the vast majority of the time, uh, you're either at work or you're spending time in, in your living quarters, which in my case happened to be something called the Cusco Barracks. And the Cusco Barracks meant I got an eight by 10 foot uh, corrugated aluminum, kind of, kind of like a shack uh, with a bathroom in the middle that you shared with another guy who had an eight by 10 next to you, actually a good buddy of mine, still talk to him and uh, yeah, still, uh, still good friends. But we, um, you know, in terms of the actual size, in terms of the actual living conditions and the food, uh, and interestingly enough, the food actually came from the same place. So uh, even though there's, um, they were given, of course, uh, special religious considerations, in many cases, our food was actually prepared by the same team. So yeah, we weren't, it wasn't like there was anything special that, uh, that was being dealt with our food and that their food was, you know, being mistreated in some way or however, the media, however else the media wants to put it. Though when I was there, I did get to uh, witness and uh, I guess just be on scene for a hunger strike that took place in early 2013 uh, because there was this, there was this big to do uh, because of course I was there when Barack Obama won re-election. Okay, that was during my, um, during my deployment. And so there was a huge push among the population thinking that he was going to shut it down. Of course, he promised this, he campaigned on this. And so the population of detainees was, was waiting for him to keep his word. And then of course, after he, and, and they had been waiting for four years thinking, oh, it's gonna come, it'll come when he's maybe, maybe in the second term, maybe he's reelected, he'll, he'll do it on day one. So day one came and day one left and uh, didn't even mention it. And so they got pretty upset about that and they moved for a hunger strike. Now, uh, for some of them, hunger strike meant it was, it was not, it was more of a symbolic hunger strike uh, rather than an actual one. They would say, I'm not going to eat. And they would tell you that and you had to write it down or not myself, but of course the, uh, the MPs. And then they would then go eat, right? So they would say, oh, I'm on hunger strike, but I told you I'm not eating. So then that, that qualifies as me not eating, right? Um, but for those who did go on hunger strike, we did put them on caloric counts. When I say we, I mean the sort of the royal we, the JTF down there. Um, so people were keep tracking them. They were tracking their health on a regular basis. The joint medical group was, was making sure that everybody was kept in, on uh, nutrition standards. And uh, for those who did actually refuse to eat, um, and this order came down from the White House, that we were not allowed to let anyone starve themselves, essentially. And so what uh, the process that was used then for anyone who got below their daily caloric intake uh, was a process known as enteral feeding and or e-feeding. So e-feeding essentially meant that a feeding tube was inserted, uh, sort of a, a lubricated feeding tube was inserted in the nose, and then uh, what, usually one of those inshore protein shakes was was used, and that would that would go straight down. And of course, of course, all the the, the lawyers for the detainees, you know, screamed uh, bloody murder, claimed this was torture, said that this was horrible. Um, but at the same time, this is the, actually a very common uh, medical procedure. It's performed for people who are, if they've recovered from operations, if they've been in accidents. Uh, this is done in hospitals across the country you know, every day. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there are people who were, when they're on the respirators, if they were using something similar uh, during the COVID outbreak that we've had. Couldn't agree with you more. Thanks for joining us on ATP Report today and a special thank you to our guest, Jack Posobiec. Can you tell Jack, uh, our viewers, where they can get a hold of you and find out what you're doing and what you're up to? Yeah, best place to get a hold of me is One American News. So OANN.com with the two N's there. Uh, you can find us available on a variety of cable platforms, or if not that, uh, you can go to Twitter. It's at Jack Posobiec, P-O-S-O-B-I-E-C. Perfect. Appreciate you joining us today. And for those of you that haven't subscribed to our text message alert system, please take out your cell phone and text the word truth in the message box and send it to 88202. Push send. You'll be automatically subscribed. You'll get all the shows like this one on your cell phone for free. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Nussbaum.